I want to talk about the secret. You know, I always love secret. <laughs> Did you notice that? Hallelujah. I want to talk about the secret of living a productive life. Hallelujah. How many of us would like to be productive? Amen. Let's open the Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. We'll see that whatever we feel in our heart is also God's desire. Please stand on your feet. We're going to read. We're going to read three scriptures quickly uh, before I get into the message. I'm going to just introduce, and next time we're going to continue. Okay, let's read the first one uh, together. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Hallelujah. Now imagine that you are a tree, okay? What God is saying here that if you don't bear fruit, then your place is the fire. Hallelujah. So basically you become a useless. That's why you go in the fire, okay? Now, I'm not preaching about hell or heaven. I'm talking about being productive. That if you are not productive, basically you become useless. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at the second verse, John 15, verse 2. John 15, verse 2. Okay, read together, please. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit is taken away, and every branch that bears fruit is pruned that it may bear more fruit. Hallelujah. You see again here how God is not only expecting us to be productive, but is putting us in a condition to be productive. Hallelujah. That's why he is in us. Amen. To cause us to be productive. That's his desire. Amen. Let's look at the last, at the last verse. Um, Mark 11, 12 to 14. The Bible says, what? Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see it. Perhaps he will find something on it. Stop there. You see, God, you know, Jesus Christ went over there expecting. Hallelujah. When God comes in our life, he's expecting for us to be productive. Because he put in us ability to be productive. Amen. Now, let's continue to say, when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for the fig. It was not the season for the fig. But look at what Jesus does. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciple heard it. Hallelujah. You remember the scripture that said, be ready in season and out of, out of season? Because it's God who controls the season. If Jesus Christ will say, I need to eat from this fruit, automatically the fruit is supposed to get the ability to produce because he's the creator. Hallelujah. When he's expecting you to produce, he knows that he put inside of you the ability. We serve a God that cannot ask you something that you cannot do. It's not a God who manipulates, who trick us and put us in situations so that we can fail and things like that. No. When he's telling you to do something because he knows that you can do it. Because himself is going to enable you to do it. So he comes to this tree. The tree does not produce. What does he do? He curses that tree. Okay? So we see here, cutting and putting in the fire. Cursing. Hallelujah. Being disconnected and being thrown away. This simply shows to us how serious... Being productive is to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God did not duplicate people on the earth. Amen. Amen. Every single person is unique Amen. and special. Hallelujah. He is a piece of the puzzle. He has an assignment God has given to him. So if he comes here, he does not produce. He's not only disturbing himself. But it's disturbing the entire puzzle. Hallelujah. He is disturbing all of us. That's why you should not see, oh, it's my life. No, 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 no. I need you to be productive because my blessing depends on you being productive. Amen. Hallelujah. 
And your blessing depends on me being productive. We are a family and a team. Hallelujah. The fact that we are a team, we have to hold each other accountable, amen, to play what we're supposed to play as a role. Hallelujah. Let me ask a question again. How many of us here want to be productive? Of course, all of us. But the problem sometimes is that we don't know how. We make effort and we don't know how. Are you not blessed that we have the Bible that tells us everything? Hallelujah. So in the next four sermon here, I'm going to try to give to you the best I know. Hallelujah. Or at least I'm going to point you in the right direction for you to research on your own to get more information. Amen. How can you be productive? Amen. Can you say, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. You may be seated. We clap our hands for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, the secret. What are the secrets to be productive? One of the things I will tell you that every time I'm trying to get to do something, because I know it is written, there is nothing new under the sun, I always try to search who has already done it. Hallelujah. Where has this thing been done before? Or who is the person who has been able to do this? Then I want to see how they did it. Hallelujah. And then once I know, I can also go and try to do what they did and perhaps more. Hallelujah. We live in a world where when somebody is being successful, people become jealous and envious of them. And they begin to try to put them down. But a, a real man of God, a real child of God, a real daughter of God or son of God, when you see somebody succeeding, you're trying to learn, what can I learn from them? Hallelujah. So when we're talking about productivity, being productive, hallelujah, producing a great amount of result, being significant, is something that we all long for. Hallelujah. Amen. Even if you caught a thief stealing and you tell him you are a thief, he's going to say, no, I'm not a thief. Because we don't like to be mediocre. Hallelujah. Amen. We like to be successful. Where do we get this from? From our heavenly father. When he created Adam and Eve, what did he do? He told them to do what? To be fruitful and multiply. Hallelujah. It was not just to make children, but to be able to be productive in every aspect of their life. Hallelujah. So God expects us to be significant. Amen. Now, who should we go after to, 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 to see as a model, someone that we can follow and model after. I don't know of anybody in this world here who has been as successful as Jesus Christ, as productive as Jesus Christ. Imagine someone who come and live in this world for 33 and a half years. He does his public ministry for three and a half years. But 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you see the impact? There are people who die for him. There are people who continue today, accept to be killed, to proclaim his word. Hallelujah. Amen. I read from John Maxwell's book. He said, a, 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 a success without a successor is a failure. In the other way, if you say, I'm successful, but after you, nothing is done, then you're a failure. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's say I'm a pastor of change the nation, and one day God chose, decided, they say, you got to come home. I go to bed, and I don't wake up, and I just find myself in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. And then this church disappears. That's a failure. Hallelujah. Amen. I am a failure. Because you got to be able to leave something behind that continues. Hallelujah. 
So Jesus Christ is successful because 2,000 years later, we are still proclaiming his word. So if there is someone we can model ourselves after, we can learn from, for us to be productive, it must be Jesus. Do you agree? Hallelujah. You can look at in the life of every prophet, any man of God, you will see some kind of failure there. But when you look at in the life of Jesus Christ, you only see perfect success. Amen. So do you agree that we have to stick with Jesus? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus has so many aspects of his life. But in this teaching, I want to focus on one aspect of his life. His schedule. <laughs> What was Jesus' schedule? How did Jesus spend his time? We're going to look at it in the Bible. Hallelujah. In the 3DM organization teaching, they call it Jesus' rhythm of life. Hallelujah. You can, you, if you, you, you have an opportunity, buy this book. Uh, he didn't pay me for that, but I, I think it's a good book, so I'm going to recommend it. Uh, Building a Discipleship Culture by Mike Breen. Wonderful book. It's going to help you to really understand Jesus' rhythm of life. Hallelujah. Amen. What is a rhythm? A rhythm is a strong, regular, and repeated pattern of movement or sound. So rhythm of life is a strong, a consistent, a regular, repeated pattern by which people do life. Your schedule can change, but the rhythm can be consistent. So I'm not just talking about the schedule of Jesus, but the rhythm that influences his schedule. Hallelujah. Because your rhythm of life will influence your schedule. Hallelujah. So there will be some element that you're going to add there. Amen. Let me give this example of music. How many of you know rumba as a style of music? Hallelujah. How many of you know uh, um, uh, how you call it? Rap music. Come on, everybody, I have to put you. You're in the U.S., you got to know rap music. Hallelujah. How, how many of you know Zook? Karaib, right? All right. So we all know Zook. We know all these things. So it doesn't matter where you play Zook in America or you play it in France. The rhythm is the same. Whether right, you're playing gospel zook or you're playing worldly zook, the rhythm is the same. Because what defines it to be rhythm is that the way of the movement of the sound. You understand? The difference is the content. Hallelujah. There is one zook music that is glorifying this world or glorifying a particular lady or glorifying the devil. But there is one zook that is singing for the honor of the creator of everything, Jesus Christ. That's the difference. Hallelujah. Amen. So the difference in your schedule and in my schedule or any other schedule is the content of the schedule. When we look at your schedule, we can determine your rhythm of life. And when we look at your rhythm of life, we can determine whether you are a true Christian or not, and what is important for you and what is not important for you. Are we good? Amen. Say to your neighbor, we all have 24 hours. So why people keep saying, I don't have time? It seems like I got more time than you. We got people in this world who have built airplane. They got 24 hours. We got people in this world who have designed cars. They got 24 hours. We got people in this world who are doing tremendous, fantastic things. They still got 24 hours. What is this excuse of, I don't have time? The reason why I cannot be productive, the reason why I cannot do this, because I did not have enough time. The problem is, perhaps you are giving your time more, you are allocating more time in things that are not important that God wants you to put in your rhythm. Hallelujah. Amen. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, 
If you want to be successful, you got to learn how to say no to important things so you can say yes in God's will for your life. Yes, that deserves a clap. Yes. Hallelujah. There are things that are very important that you got to do. But you got to be able to say, not today. Because there is something that are urgent and are so extremely important because God wants you to do that at that time. Hallelujah. One thing you will notice as we go deep in the scripture in this fourth sermon about in Jesus' uh, 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 lifestyle, one thing you will notice is that Christ focused in doing the will of his father. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Constantly say, not my will, but your will be done. His rhythm of life was surrounded with what is the will of God. I can even imagine him early in the morning, waking up in the morning and asking the father, Daddy, what are you doing today through me? Hallelujah. Amen. It's not, Lord, this is my agenda. Can you bless it? This is what I'm thinking to do. Can you bless it? But Jesus, I see him going to the Father and saying, what are you doing so I can join you in what you're doing? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we got the difference as Bishop Johnson preached to us last week. That God using us is like God putting his hands in a glow. Hallelujah. But I'm thinking that most of the time we are using God as a glove. So basically, I got my thing I want to do. I already have my decision. I know exactly what I want to do. But then I go, I take God to use him as a tool that I can manipulate. Hallelujah. Amen. But what God is asking us is actually to be the glove. Hallelujah. Woo! That he can put his hands in us and use us. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Are we good? Amen. What was Jesus schedule like? The schedule of someone will often be influenced by his environment. Hallelujah. Amen. The way he brought up. Hallelujah. Amen. And what is important in that time and the influence he has received in his life. We all grow up as children observing, looking at things, and seeing people, how they're acting. We look at our parents. And then we imitate them. Jesus Christ that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about Jesus Christ, the son of God portion. Hallelujah. He's 100% God. Amen. But he's also 100% man. So I'm talking about Jesus Christ, man. Hallelujah. Amen. He was influenced by the culture also of his nation. He was a Jew. Hallelujah. So his rhythm of life will be definitely influenced by that. Hallelujah. Amen. So how is that going to be influenced? We got to do a little research here to try to understand how did Jew people organize time? Because when we talk about schedule, we have to look at time. Hallelujah. From this time to this time, what do you do? So we got to see how do they see time. Go with me in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, and I'll show you something there. Let's read together. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. What is wrong with this picture here? We know, hallelujah, Amen. that the day, the, the day starts in the morning, and then finish in the evening. Right or no? Yes. Hallelujah. But when you read in the scripture, the day starts in the evening and continue in the morning. Hallelujah. This is 
the way the ancient Jew will read time. Day is not starting in the morning. Day is starting in the evening. Understand the book of Genesis is written by Moses. And Moses is talking about the creation. And Moses was not there when God was creating the world. So definitely God is the one telling him what to write. Because nobody was there. Hallelujah. So it start the day, they start the day in the evening and end it in the daytime. The question now is what? What did they do in the evening? Hallelujah. I didn't touch Jesus yet. Let's talk about his culture, where he grew up. They started their day in the evening around the fire. Hallelujah. Family will gather together around the fire and they will tell jokes. They will tell stories, anecdotes. They will use that time as time to eat together and have fun. Things that will definitely help you relax your mind. And then, after that, they will go to bed. And then they will wake up in the morning. The day will start. Hallelujah. Amen. How that look like? They started the day not with work. They started the day with rest. Hallelujah. They started the day with rest. Most of the time what we do, we start the day with work, then we go to rest. Hallelujah. But as we see here the way God is presenting things, don't start with work and then go rest. Start resting so that you can go work. There is a difference. Let me give you an example how we get this thing so wrong before I come back to my notes here. You work, you work, you work, you work, you work, you work, and you are so tired, right? And then you go to sleep. And then as you, even as you are sleeping, you are not resting. Because you are constantly thinking that my alarm has to ring at 5 o'clock because I got to take a shower and go to work or study or do something. So you are not properly resting. So by the time you go to work, you know what happened at work? You are surviving with five hours energy. You know that product they call five hour energy? You are surviving with coffee. They know you at work. The first thing you come when you come to make coffee, you say I make for everybody else, but you know it's first of all for yourself. <laughs> because without that, you cannot survive. Because you don't sleep well. And therefore, you cannot be productive. Because you are waking out of that tiredness. Okay? You're barely trying to make effort to do certain things. And especially those people who are working as machine operator in company, they give you production. They tell you that you got to produce 1,500 uh, this and that cup of water before you go home. If not, we're going to fire you. And you keep calling these people racist because they're firing you in every company you are going, because you are not putting production. But the issue is not them. The issue is how are you resting before you come to work? So secret number one is resting. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Say to your neighbor, have you been resting? Do you want to be productive? Don't learn how to work hard. See, a person who has rest properly will take a few minutes to do something well than the person who did not rest properly. He's going to take a long time because he's already tired. He does not have enough energy to carry out what he's supposed to do. What we're seeing in Jesus' culture here is that they started the day with rest. Hallelujah. Amen. Are we good? Amen. Resting in the Jewish culture was not a choice. It was an obligation. 
It was a way you honor God. It was a commandment. Let's look at Exodus chapter 20, 8 to 11. The Bible said, remember, let's read together, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Continue. Six day you shall labor and do all your work. Okay? But the seventh day is Sabbath of the Lord your God. In, in it you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male, nor your servant, nor your female, nor your servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gate. It means if you live in my house on the sixth day, you're not doing nothing. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all is, uh, all is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and uh, uh, law with Along with it. Hallelujah. So basically, God imposed them. It is a law. It is an obligation that they must rest. Hallelujah. And remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you should keep my commandment. So how can you be a child of God and you don't rest? You say, I was doing that for the Lord. It's time for God to do things through you instead of you doing things for God. Hallelujah. Amen. Are we good? Yes, sir. I'm going to mess up people's mind today. According to us, rest is stopping to work so that you can relax, right? But in the Jewish culture, rest was time alone or with friends to have fun. Dinner with friends. Telling story around the fire. Laughter. Resting all your, your, your three dimensions. Your body, your soul, and your spirit. As you went to bed, you have refreshed, gathered energy to tackle the new day. Also, throughout the day, you will see them taking the time to rest, the taking break. And we're going to look at that in the life of Jesus with evidence, with proof. Hallelujah. But you know what we do? We do not rest. We think like sleeping is the only version of resting. But sometimes you go to bed, you can't sleep. You know why you can't sleep? Because you are not resting. Sleep is supposed to help you rest. But if you don't rest at the faculty of your body and of your life, you will not even be able to sleep. That's why you always have to depend on medication. Hallelujah. Are we good? Am I still preaching the word? So you will see that in their culture, resting is not absence of activity. It's not inactivity. You sit down and you say, I'm resting. No, resting means do something that will refresh your body, will refresh your mind, will refresh your spirit. Some people, for them to relax their mind, they do sport. Hallelujah. He has to be in that treadmill and run. After he does that for 30, 40 minutes, they feel ready to go. They feel tired, and when they go to sleep, they really sleep. But some people, they don't do those kind of things. So when they go to bed to sleep, they have nightmare. They say, the demon is following me. The demon is not following you. You're not resting your mind. Hallelujah. How can you have bad dreams where you had good time with your family? You watch a movie together with a comedy movie and you laugh, you laugh, you laugh, you go to bed. You can only dream you're laughing. Okay? But then you are frustrated about everything. You sit down there and begin to uh, think about you took the work at home. The devil is a liar. Hallelujah. Some people take work, work with the computer at home. But some people take work in their mind at home. Whatever the supervisor did to them, whatever the friend did to them, whatever happened there, they begin to rehearse that. And sometimes even they begin to talk about it in the family. So everybody's mad at the supervisor that they never seen. Hallelujah. 
Even your kids say, when I see him, I'm going to beat him. But they don't know this guy. So with all that frustration, people go to bed, and then they're expecting God to speak to them. Well, the Bible tells us that when we sleep, he comes to give us revelation. But how can you give you a revelation where your mind is not resting? Hallelujah. I'm not defining rest yet. Say, pastor is only introducing. It's going to get deeper here. See, this is, this is why Jesus had an issue with the Pharisee. Because they misunderstood the Sabbath day. They will go around and see people that you should not do anything. Jesus is trying to heal somebody. They're like, no, you can't do that on Sabbath day. Because they knew that naturally... Nobody is able to be inactive. Because we have three dimensions. Even when my body is not functioning, my mind is working. Somebody like me, I'm constantly thinking. Hallelujah. I'm constantly thinking. So how can I be inactive? Okay. So the Pharisees, they knew that. That this law here, nobody's going to be able to keep it. So they made it a business. Themselves, they were working on Sabbath day. You know what? Because they're going around checking out. So, oh, Albert is working. You got to pay $20. Yeah. Or so, so They're making money on that day. So Jesus come and fix them and say, was Sabbath made for men or men for Sabbath? What's wrong with you? In the other way, you don't even understand the purpose of Sabbath. Yeah. Hallelujah. It does not mean inactivity. It means do things that will help you to relax your body, your mind, your soul and your spirit to be refreshed so that when the day comes, you're ready to work. And when you are working at that point, you will be productive. I'm not preaching good no more. Hallelujah. So say to your neighbor, neighbor, resting does not mean inactivity, but activity that helps you relax in all your three dimensions, your body, your soul, and your spirit. And I want you to understand that all of us, we're going to have a different way to rest because we don't have the same hobby. Some people like movie. Some people like reading. Some people just like music. Some pe- that's the way they relax. You understand? So find what is it that works with you and do it. Don't be so super spiritual that even there are movies that you cannot watch. Today's movie, even if they say PG-13, you will see stuff there that are complicated. Even cartoon, they got things that are complicated. So if that's the reason why you're not going to watch movie, you're wasting your time. By the way, you see that at work. You see that on the street. You see that everywhere. Stop being hypocrite. I'm protecting myself. You're protecting yourself against what? You understand? Amen. Hallelujah. Say, so do your name, will let Jesus live his life in you. <laughs> Relax. Even basketball, if you don't know how to throw it, it's easy basketball. You just have to take that ball and put it in the other side, in that thing you throw there. I don't understand the rule, but if somebody's going to bring me there, I'm just, maybe I may get lucky and again go. You understand? Football, soccer, whatever. Do something. Say to your neighbor, do something or you die young. See, the reason why God saved you and did not kill you when he saved you, because he did not save you only for you to go to heaven. God saved you and decided to live in you so you can become an instrument. Hallelujah. How can you use a car that is not healthy? The motor is not working. The the, the, the transmission is no good. The the, the tire is not fine. If you want to take a benefit of your car, you need to be in good standing. You need something they call tune-up. Say to your neighbor, you need tune-up. Resting is a tune-up. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's helping you to refresh yourself. It's not a sin. It's a way for you to 
get deeper with God. Hallelujah. Amen. There are good things that we can talk about, but I have to stop here and continue next time. Hallelujah. Amen. Say to your neighbor again, neighbor, Amen. resting Amen. is not a choice. It's an obligation. You must rest. And resting is not inactivity. Hallelujah. It's doing the things you love that helps you to rest your body, your, your soul, and your spirit. Because God wants you to be emotionally correct. Wants you physically correct, spiritually correct, so that you can be a good instrument that will reproduce and bear fruits. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Did you receive this message? Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Stand on your feet. We're going to pray.